So when we first learned about limits, we looked at them graphically from the left side and the right side, and then we looked at them from both sides. But so far, when we've been evaluating limits analytically, we've only been looking at them from both sides and not one side or the other. But now that we've discussed continuity in the previous lesson, we can now look at one-sided limits and how to evaluate them analytically. However, it's not always going to be a different process. For example, take a look at this limit as x approaches 3 from the left side of 2x. Well, this function is a continuous function, 2x. No matter what value of x we plug in, we're going to get a real defined value on the other end. So it doesn't matter what side we look at x equals 3 of this function, we're always going to have that same limit. So in this case, we can just plug in as we normally would for any other limit. So in this case, our limit would be 2 times 3, which equals 6. So that's no different than a limit from both sides. It doesn't matter we're looking at the left side, it's still going to be the same value. And then if we look at this limit here, we have the limit as x approaches 5 from the right side of x minus 5 divided by x squared minus 25. Well, in this case, we don't have a completely continuous function. We do have a discontinuity because of our denominator. If we were to plug in 5 or negative 5, we would have an undefined value. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that the limit from one side is going to be different from the other, because if the discontinuity at x equals 5 is removable, then it's the same as if we were looking at this limit from both sides. So if we were to factor the bottom, so we would have the limit as x approaches 5 from the right of x minus 5 times x plus 5, and then we still have our x minus 5 on the top, we can cancel out our x minus 5s, and our limit would then be equal to the limit as x approaches 5 from the right of just 1 over x plus 5. And notice, while we still have a discontinuity down here at x equals negative 5, because if I plugged in negative 5, we would have that undefined value, we're only interested in the value x equals 5 from the right side. And so we were able to remove the discontinuity for x equals 5, which was this right here. And so since it's gone, it doesn't matter what side we look at this function, for x equals 5, it's going to be the same. Because if you remember with this kind of function, if we were to look at the graph, we would have some sort of line with a hole that would then continue. So it doesn't matter that this value at x equals 5 is discontinuous and removable, because both sides of the function lead to the same y value. So because we're able to remove that discontinuity, we can just plug in and evaluate this limit like we would any other limit. So this would be equal to 1 over 5 plus 5, which is equal to one tenth. And so any time that we can use one of our methods for evaluating limits to simplify our function and allow us to maybe remove a discontinuity, we should do that and then we will be able to evaluate the one-sided limit just like we would a two-sided limit. But what if we can't? What if we can't redefine our function to remove any discontinuities and it's still going to be undefined at a value that we're approaching? Well, let's take a look at that. So here we have the function 1 over x, and we're going to be looking at the limit as x approaches 0 from the right side. And you'll notice that if we were to plug in 0 into this equation, we'd have 0 in the denominator and an undefined value. And you'll also notice that we cannot reduce this function in any way. We cannot redefine it. It is in its simplest form, just 1 over x. There's nothing we can do to make it so we can plug in 0. So our only option here is to plug in values close to zero from the right side and see if we can conclude that it has a limit. And so if we're looking at numbers from the right side of x equals zero, we'd be looking at positive numbers, right? And you could pick integers like one, two, and three and see what happens. But I encourage you, if you have a calculator, to pick numbers that are even closer to zero. Numbers like 0 0.1 and 0 0.01 and 0.001. So if I were to plug these into the function and notice that each of these is closer to zero than the previous one, and so we're gonna see what happens to the output of our function as we get closer to zero. So if I were to plug these numbers into the function, we have one over 0.1, and that's going to be equal to 10. And then we'd have one over 0.01, which is equal to 100. And then we'd have one over 0.001, which is equal to 1000. So as we get closer to zero, we are getting larger and larger numbers. So although this limit doesn't exist at this value of x, 
we can say that it is approaching infinity. So we could say that it's approaching positive infinity because it's getting larger and larger. And the reason why we say it doesn't exist, but it does approach infinity is because infinity isn't really a number. It's not a finite limit, it's an infinite limit. So then if we looked at the limit as x approaches zero from the left side of one over x, what are we gonna find here? Well, I'm gonna also pick numbers close to zero, but from the left side. So that would be negative numbers. So we can plug in these same numbers that we did before, but their negative counterparts and see what happens here. So in this case, we have one over negative 0.1, that's going to be equal to negative 10. Then we'll have one over negative 0.01, which is equal to negative 100. And then we have one over negative 0.001, which will be equal to negative 1000. And so in this case, as we get closer and closer to zero from the left side or from the negative numbers, we're going to get smaller and smaller values. So we would say in this case that although our limit does not exist, it approaches negative infinity. And so that would be why, if we were to look at the limit from both sides of this function, one over x, as x approaches zero, it would not exist in general because from one side it's going to negative infinity and from the other side it's going to infinity. But if I wanna know what's happening with this function, I'm gonna to have to evaluate it from the left and the right side. Otherwise, taking the limit from both sides doesn't tell me anything. If I wanna know the behavior of this function, I'm going to have to look at each side individually, which is why we're interested in how to evaluate these. And just for some clarity, if we were to draw the graph of this function, it would look a little bit like this. And so our results are actually going to match this graph pretty well, because we saw from the right side of zero, we were heading towards infinity. And then from the left side, we were approaching negative infinity. Now we can apply that method of plugging in numbers close to the value of x we're approaching to other limits as well. And that includes limits of functions from both sides of that function. So here we have a limit as x approaches one of one over x minus one squared. And if we were to plug in one in this equation, we would have one minus one squared, which is zero. So we have zero in the denominator. So this would be an undefined value. And we also see that this function cannot be redefined or simplified in any way. We could factor the bottom, but that's not going to get us anywhere because there's nothing on the top to cancel out with that. So this is in its simplest form. There's nothing we can do to redefine it and be able to plug in. So we would say that this limit does not exist, but we still wanna look at what it's approaching. It might approach infinity or negative infinity. And so this is where that idea of infinite limits comes from because it doesn't approach a finite value, it approaches an infinite value. And so because we can't plug in, we're gonna to have to check values from the left and the right side. So I'm gonna write the limit as x approaches one from the right side of this function. And we will plug in numbers close to one from the right side. So in this case, 1.1 would be pretty close to one. So we could plug that in. And by using a calculator, I'll find that this is 100. And then I can plug in a number even closer to one, such as 1.01, .01, and that will get me 10,000. So I'm gonna stop right there because that's a pretty big indication to me that this function is getting larger and larger as we get closer to one from the right side. So we can make a pretty good conclusion here that from the right side, this function is headed towards positive infinity. So then if we were to look at the limit as x approaches one from the left side, what's gonna happen here? Well, now we're gonna look at numbers that are close to one from the left side. So these would be numbers less than one. Last time we looked at from the right side, so we had to look at numbers greater than one. So now we're gonna look at numbers less than one because we're looking at it from the left side. So a number that I picked was 0 0.9. And if we plug that into the function, we'll get 100. And then I picked 0.99, which is even closer to one. When I plug that in, I get 10,000 as well. So again, I'm gonna stop right there because I can clearly see that this value is going to get larger as we get close to one from the left side. So once again, I can conclude that we're approaching infinity. So then I can go back here and although this limit doesn't exist in terms of finite limits, we can say that this approaches infinity because from the right and the left side, it approaches infinity. If these didn't agree, if one was negative infinity and the other one was positive infinity, this would still just not exist in general. There's no finite limit and no infinite limit. But since they did agree, it's positive infinity. So now I wanna look at a function that you're probably not too familiar with, but it is kind of helpful to look at when we're talking about one-sided limits and why they're important 
So here we have the greatest integer function. And the greatest integer function outputs the greatest integer n such that that n is less than or equal to the x we plugged in. So for example, if I were to plug in 1.5, what is the greatest integer n such that it's less than or equal to this number here? Well, the greatest integer that's less than that would be 1. Because if I pick 2, 2 would be greater than 1.5, not less than. So this is the greatest integer that is less than this value. If I plugged in 2.3, that would be equal to 2, because 2 is the greatest integer less than this value. And then we could also do this for negative 0.5, and the greatest integer less than negative 0.5 would be negative 1, not 0, because 0 is greater than negative 0.5. So that's kind of how that function works. But if we were to look at the graph, We'll quickly notice that if we wanted to look at the limit at any integer value, like 1 or 2, the limit from both sides are not going to be equal. From one side, we're at one value, and from the other side, we're at another value. So if we wanted to look at the limit from both sides, it's always going to be non-existent. It's not going to exist. So this is a function where we always have to look at an integer from one side or the other if we want to know what the limit is. So let's look at some limits of the greatest integer function and see how we evaluate them analytically. So first we have the limit as x approaches 1 from the right for this greatest integer function. And what we're going to do here is we're going to plug in values close to 1 from the right side. So in this case, those would be numbers like 1.1 and 1.01. So if I were to plug in each of these into that function, all we have to ask ourselves is, what is the greatest integer that is less than this number? Well, it would be 1. And then if we look at this one, the greatest integer less than this value would also be 1. So as we pick numbers that are closer and closer to 1, the output is going to continue to be 1. It's not going to change. And so then we can say that the limit is going to be 1 as we approach 1 from the right. And then if we looked at the limit as x approaches 1 from the left side, we then have to look at numbers less than 1 that are really close to 1. So in this case, we could look at numbers like 0 0.9 and 0 0.99. And so for each of these, we ask ourselves, what is the greatest integer less than 0 0.9? In this case, 0. And then for 0 0.99, the greatest integer or whole number less than 0 0.99 is also 0. So then we'd say that the limit as x approaches 1 from the left side would also be 0. So you can see that from the right side and the left side, these two do not agree. So the limit as x approaches 1 from both sides of the greatest integer function would not exist. So that's where one-sided limits can be helpful in describing the behavior of really weird functions that can't be described with two-sided limits otherwise. So when we had those limits where the answer resulted in an infinite limit, such as infinity or negative infinity, we call those infinite limits. And so we actually have some properties regarding those infinite limits that we can talk about and then maybe use to evaluate some more complex limits that you may come across. So just like when we looked at the properties of finite limits, we'll have two limits of two functions that we will define and then use in our properties. So first we have the limit as x approaches c of f of x is going to be equal to infinity and then we're going to have the limit as x approaches c of g of x is going to be equal to some finite limit, l. And then we're going to use these for our properties. So we'll start with the sum and difference property, which says that the limit as x approaches c of the function f of x plus or minus g of x is going to be equal to infinity. So if you have an infinite limit and a finite limit and you add them together, they're going to be equal to infinity. And this also works for subtraction. If you were going to subtract a finite limit from infinity, then you're also just going to have infinity. And we will look at examples of these at the end. So next we have our product property, and that says that the limit as x approaches c for f of x times g of x is equal to infinity if l is greater than 0 it would be equal to negative infinity if L is less than zero. So what that means is, is if our limit is a positive finite limit and it's multiplied by a limit that is infinite, we're going to have a positive infinity. But if our limit is a negative finite value, then it's going to be negative infinity. 
And then we have our quotient property, which says that the limit as x approaches c of g of x divided by f of x is equal to that finite limit over infinity, which is going to be equal to zero. And so that's just one that is maybe nice to memorize, because if you have a finite value divided by an infinite value, then it's going to be zero. Now, all of these properties also apply for negative infinity. So let's say that instead of this limit being positive infinity, that it was negative infinity. How does this change things? Well, for the sum and difference property, it's going to make this one negative infinity, because if you're adding a finite limit or subtracting a finite limit from a negative infinite value, it's still going to be negative infinity. So then for our second property, these two things are going to flip. So if our L is less than zero, it's going to be infinity. And if our L is greater than zero, it'll be negative infinity. And that would be because if L is less than zero, we have a negative finite limit times a negative infinite limit. Remember that if you multiply two negative values together, you get a positive value. So that's why this is positive. And then if you have a finite limit greater than zero, it's a positive value multiplied by a negative value. So it's still going to be negative. So for negative infinity, the rules of the product property flip. And then if it was negative infinity for our third property, as you see here in the denominator, it would still be zero. So that one doesn't change. But now let's look at these properties in action. First, we have the limit as x approaches zero of one plus one over x squared. And in this case, we know that the limit as x approaches zero of one is equal to one. And we also know that the limit as x approaches zero for one over x squared is going to be equal to infinity. If you're not convinced, here's quickly the graph of this function. And as you see, as we approach zero from each side, we're going to be going to infinity. So then because we know the values of these two limits, and we're taking the limit as x approaches zero of both of them added together, we see that we have a finite limit and an infinite limit. So then we can say that this equals infinity. So then we have the limit as x approaches zero of negative four divided by x squared. And this can be rewritten as the limit as x approaches zero of negative four times one over x squared. And now we have two limits multiplied that we know the values of. We know that the limit as x approaches zero of negative four is equal to negative four. And we know that the limit as x approaches zero of one over x squared is infinity. We just did that up here as well. It's the same function at the same value. So then we see that we have a negative finite limit times a positive infinite limit. So then we're going to have negative infinity as our limit for the whole function. So that's how we get these two answers using our properties. And now we have one more to look at. So now we're going to use our quotient property. And here we have the limit as x approaches zero from the right side of two divided by cotangent x. And we know that the limit as x approaches zero from the right side of any constant function, no matter what side we're looking at, actually, it's just going to be the value of that constant. So this is two. And then the limit as x approaches zero from the right side of cotangent x is actually equal to infinity. So if you were gonna plug in values that are close to zero from the right side into this function, you would find that you would be getting closer and closer to infinity. So then because we know those two limits, we can say that this limit is equal to two divided by that infinite value, which we know from our quotient property is zero. And so that's how we use that property. All right, so that's all I had for this lesson. Hopefully you learned something. If you don't quite understand one of these concepts, feel free to watch the examples video that will be linked at the end of this video, as well as in the description. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments. But that's all I have for now, so I will see you next time.